Please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel according to John, as we will read from John chapter 14, this verses 1 through 14. John 14, 1 through 14. And there we hear the Lord Himself speaking. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and re receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works which I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So far, the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> now this morning, we want to be guided again by our Heidelberg Catechism, and we have come to Lord's Day 46, as you may find it in the back of your Psalter on page 83. Lord's Day 46, question and answers number 120 and 121. Why has Christ commanded us to address God thus, our Father? The answer, that immediately, in the very beginning of our prayer, he might excite in us a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely, that God is become our Father in Christ and will much less deny us what we ask of Him in true faith than our parents will refuse us earthly things. Why is it here added, which art in heaven? Answer, lest we should form any earthly conceptions of God's heavenly majesty, and that we may expect from His almighty power all things necessary for soul and body. So far then, the reading of God's holy word, and our text is particularly as we find it here in John 14 and verse 8, where we read, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. So far then, the reading of our guide, the Heidelberg Catechism, and also the reading of our text, God's Holy Word. <clears throat> now, congregation, during the days when our Savior was on earth, the disciples followed Him, and they learned tremendous things from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they came to him with questions. And from those questions, they were able to hear answers that were amazing. And we have one of those amazing answers to a question that Philip asked the Lord Jesus. Philip asked him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient for us. And then Jesus gave an amazing answer. And he said to Philip and to all of the disciples, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then he adds as well that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. Now just, just think about that for a moment because when we understand this rightly, it will enrich our prayer life. First of all, we see that the Father and the Son are intimately related to one another and they dialogue, they speak with one another um, in such a way that, that it should encourage us in our prayers to the Father and to the Son. That is the second thing we must think of, and that is when we pray to the Father, we at the same time pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, if I may say it this way, the Lord Jesus Christ has an intimate connection with the Father. What we pray to Christ, Christ prays to the Father, and the Father will always hear the Son, Jesus Christ. The third thing that we can learn from it is this, and that when we will hear about the various qualities and, 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 and characteristics of the Father, we can actually say the same thing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is, of course, why we will be considering the Father in particular this morning hour through the proclamation of the Word. And I hope and pray that it will enrich our prayer life as we consider then the address, the address that is our Father in heaven. So as theme and division I have for you as follows Christ, teaches us to address God as our Father. He is a gracious Father. He is a heavenly Father. And He is an almighty Father. Now, congregation, unlike some fathers in this world, God fully deserves to be called Father. And the reason for this is obvious, isn't it? Because He has children for whom He cares for, whom He loves, whom He guides, he never leaves them. He never abandons them. God deserves, therefore, to be called Father because He is never abusive. He is never violent towards His children. He is never unreasonable with His children. He deserves to be called Father, you see, because He understands the needs of His Father. He takes time to listen to them, and He does everything to provide for them. Christ Jesus explains, therefore, what kind of father God is when he says, for instance, in Matthew chapter 7, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who who ask him. And if, if you might still wonder what kind of father God is, then listen to Christ Jesus as he tells, for instance, the parable of the prodigal son. There you will see the father standing on the middle of the highway with his hands cusps over his eyes. And he looks for his long lost son who's coming there in the distance. And when he finally sees him, what does he do? Here this old man runs to his son. He embraces him and he kisses him. This, as the Lord Jesus Christ portrays it for us, this is the picture of our Father in heaven. A gracious Father. A gracious Father. 
This is what we as believers may confess about God. He is our gracious Father who loves nothing more than to embrace us in love. Now, not everyone in this world knows the Father in this way. And perhaps I would say not yet, because we hope that, yes, many will come to know Him in this way. And those who do not know Him yet may even be covenant people. Christ Jesus once addressed some Pharisees and scribes of his day. Now they were leaders of God's old covenant people. But Jesus had something unflattering to say to them. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. And so our catechism addresses the question of who could speak of God as their father, and it says then that God is become our father in Christ. There you have it again, in Christ. In other words, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way, you too will have the privilege of knowing and of calling God my Father. You will learn to understand what it means that God is a gracious Father. And then we read in the Catechism as well, God has become our Father in Christ, which implies that something tremendous has happened that made God my, your Father. And so we see something here of the, the gospel of the triune God that is revealed to us here in our catechism. Now let me show you this for a moment. There is something of the gospel of the Father here, definitely. And as I turn uh, to my Bible and turn to uh, Genesis, I hear God the Father calling out to his lost and fallen child, Adam, Adam, where are you? And when God saw that Adam was so fallen and had so lost that he could not call his, him so that he could not be called his, that is God's child anymore, and that is Adam began to trail after another father, namely the devil, then God in his gracious love sent his own beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of his father's house and that on a rescue mission. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, therefore, opens up and I see the Son go after fallen, lost man in order to seek and to save the lost. But the Son had to go deeper. He had to go a deep way in order to reach down to fallen man. So deep even that the Son himself at a certain moment, lost contact with the Father, and in his dying moment, could not even call God his Father anymore. But he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the cry of the Son's abandonment, abandonment while hanging on the cross, was therefore the rescue cry for fallen man. What a marvelous Savior He is, isn't He? A marvelous Savior. Do you not adore Him for who He is and for what He has done? And then, to round off the gospel of the triune God, something of the, of the, of the gospel of the Holy Spirit also begins to open up to you. And I see and I hear and I feel the Holy Spirit beginning to make room for Christ and his salvation in my heart, in my life. Then the Spirit begins to take that word, and he begins to persuade me of the attractiveness and of the loveliness of Jesus Christ, and the attractiveness and loveliness of the Father who is in Christ, and Christ in the Father. He begins to persuade us how, how suitable Christ Jesus is for your and for my need. He begins to convince me with words and also with thoughts, 
which I cannot ignore and will teach me that Christ Jesus, He is the one who will make me a child of the Father again. That Christ Jesus has paid the price for such a transaction. Therefore, I will confess my sins. I will plead forgiveness of my sins. I will resolve to lean on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to, as it were, carry me back to the Father because He will show me the Father. I will then discover God to be a very gracious Father. And as such, the Holy Spirit will begin to bear witness to my spirit as well that I too am a child of God and that He will give me then the liberty even to confess Abba, Father, literally, as a child would say, Dad, or even Daddy. And this, as you know, dear people, is the result of the new birth, which is celebrated so wonderfully well in John chapter 3. We're all three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have their working part in turning you into a child of a gracious Father. After all, it is the new birth, isn't it? And the new birth alone that changes a person from a child of wrath to a child of the Father. As it says so beautifully in the form of baptism that Yes, a child of wrath into a child of a gracious father. And so, who may know God as a gracious father? According to the words of our catechism, those for whom God is become father in Christ. And so, dear people, have you learned to confess that you too have fallen away from the father by your sin? And that you could rightfully be disowned, therefore, by the Father as well. And at the same time, have you learned to see your need for Christ, who with His sacrifice and by His sacrifice alone can turn you to a right relationship with the Father again? Have you come to know God and the gentle influence of the Holy Spirit as your Father through faith? In Jesus Christ, you see how, how the Trinity is at work also in this? Now listen carefully, and don't get me wrong. I am not only asking, are you a covenant child? I am asking you, by what you've just heard, if you are born again, if you are born from above, if you have become a child of the Father, and it is then that you will be able to confess God as a gracious Father. Boys, girls, young people, don't be satisfied just to know that you are born in the covenant. Absolutely, this is a great privilege that you should never put aside. But to be born in the covenant is not enough to be saved and to call yourself saved. You must be a living child. You must have a living, a childlike relationship with God through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a, an old poetry line which was often quoted in olden days that says, "'Tis a point I long to know. Am I his or am I no? And so... I ask you, can you confess God as your gracious Father in Christ? Now, I know that the time of youth bring on many longings and many desires. Boys and girls, particularly teenagers, can therefore just sit there daydreaming. But I ask you, isn't it one of your daydreams isn't it one of your longings? Isn't it one of your desires?
to know God as your gracious Father so that you too can say, in Christ, He is my Abba, my Father, my Dad. And you who have made public confession of faith, you who have the privilege of regularly confirming it by faithfully participating in the Lord's Supper. Let me encourage you, therefore, to call God my Father, Abba. And this is what we are taught to pray, after all, not only by the Lord's Prayer, but also by the prayer in the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And let me just quote that for you, that we may not doubt, but you will forever be our gracious Father, nevermore imputing our sins unto us, and providing us with all things necessary as well for the body as the soul as your beloved children and heirs. And so you see again, by faith in Christ, you have the privilege of knowing God as your gracious Father. And it honors Him. It brings Him praise when you address Him as such. But now, there is something more that must be said in our address to God, as Christ Jesus himself teaches us when he says, Our Father in heaven. And so, let us then consider this in the second place by the heading, He is our heavenly Father. And our catechism asks, Why is it here added, Who is in heaven? And then he gives the following answer lest we should form any earthly conceptions of God's heavenly majesty. Now, this is also what Christ himself has taught, you see. And if you listen very carefully, you will discover how wise a teacher Jesus Christ is. As soon as he begins to teach you to pray, our Father, he immediately adds to it in heaven. And this in turn should therefore teach us, dear people, that although we may use great familiarity in addressing God as our Father, even as Abba, there is a limit. There is a condition, if you like, to this familiarity. You see, God is not like a Father on earth, but He is a heavenly Father. He is the heavenly Father. Father. As such, we as fathers are but weak and poor reflections. God is the heavenly Father, and this speaks of proper respect for who God is. And true enough, we may have great familiarity in our prayer to God, but you must at the same time maintain proper respect for who you are addressing in fact, great familiarity and proper respect is a sign of true godliness. And if you read your Bible very carefully and consider the prayers that are recorded in the Bible, you will discover that deep spiritual godliness in prayer generates, as it were, a type of personal familiarity combined with proper respect. Personal familiarity says, Our Father, a proper respect adds, in heaven. Let me give you an example of this wonderful combination of personal familiarity and proper respect. The example is with Abraham. Abram is known as the friend of God and known as a man, as a man who walked with God. God considered his Abram his special friend. And Abram enjoyed a very close relationship with God. And when Abram prayed to God, he spoke with personal familiarity. But at the same time, he maintained proper respect. For instance, as we read in Genesis 18, verse 27, then Abram answered and said, Indeed, now, I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. 
No. This shows you. This, this, this shows proper respect that is taught by Christ. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. Christ teaches us, therefore, the following. And he says, as it were, to us, People, do not forget this. God is in heaven, and you are upon earth. Well, now, remembering this should keep us respectful and humble and small before God. God is our heavenly Father, and this must come out in the way you address Him. God is our heavenly Father, which should make you very thankful to know Him as such. After all, this means that unlike some fathers on earth, He never breaks a promise. He never abuses His children. He is never short-tempered. He is never unreasonable with His children. He is your heavenly Father. You may therefore take comfort as well in the fact that He will never abandon you. As He has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. To the contrary, as a child of the Heavenly Father, you may be assured that the Heavenly Father is faithful, and get this, He is faithful to all of His promises. And that is what we need to look at for a moment. Therefore, you and I, we must study those promises. And we must take those promises back in prayer to our Father in heaven. And we must say, as it were, my Father, please honor those promises and fulfill them in my life. And then, what Father on earth can resist when his child says, and his child grabs him by the hand, but Daddy, you have promised our Father in heaven. Dear people, those words should motivate you and me to pray more confidently, to pray more boldly, to pray more fervently, because our Heavenly Father promises so much. And we need to study the Bible more and more to discover those promises. Now, there's something else yet about confessing that He is our Heavenly Father, and I trust that will also be for your comfort as well. It means, as He Himself has said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As your Heavenly Father, and He knows what is best for you, He will sometimes choose ways that you do not understand, which might even go against your thinking and against your desires. As such, you might even be inclined to say at times, but God, this, this can't be right. Perhaps you've come down with a serious illness and you are concerned on, on how you will be able to provide for your family. Perhaps you have what is called in the Bible a thorn in the flesh. Whatever that might be, with the Apostle Paul, it may have been poor eyesight, it may have been a hunchback, it may have been whatever else, it may have been a stammering or a stuttering. You wonder how you would ever be able to serve in the church as an office bearer. You might then protest even in prayer and say, would it not be better, Lord, if this thorn in the flesh could be taken from me? But then your heavenly Father will respond and He will say to you, my child, my ways are higher than your ways. I am in heaven and you are upon this earth and I know what is best for you. You must understand this because my grace will be sufficient for you. Congregation, we must not have any earthly ideas of God's fatherhood. What he says is sometimes beyond our understanding. As his creatures, we cannot call him to the bar 
of human judges. We cannot ask him and call him to account as to what he is doing. As the Apostle Paul says it in Romans 9 and verse 20, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? God is in heaven. And if you have learned to know him as your father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then learn also to leave it with him as to the ways he takes with you. Do not try to take the steering wheel out of, of your life, out of his hands. You know, in the, the 60s and the 70s, and I believe and in the 80s, uh, the cars would not have bucket seats up front. They would have a bench seat. And sometimes, and I've had it myself, experienced it myself too, our little boy would sit right next to me. And he would ask me, Dad, can I steer it for a while? <clears throat> I would have to say, no, son, I cannot allow you to do this because we won't know where we'll be going. Now, perhaps you would like to take the steering wheel in your hand because you think that another direction is better. But I would say, leave the steering wheel in the hands of your Heavenly Father. He is your Heavenly Father and He will steer you through the twists and the turns of life towards Himself. And then think of it. Think of it. You do not have to deal with someone on earth about your sins, but you may deal with your Father in heaven. People on earth sometimes do forgive. Sometimes they do not forgive. And they certainly will not forget the wrong that you have done to them. But when your father forgives, he has promised that he would never remember your sins anymore, even as we are told in Psalm 103, 11 through 13. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us as a Father. <clears throat> he is a gracious Father. He is a Heavenly Father. And now briefly in the third place, let me show you, He is an Almighty Father. Our Catechism explains this clearly and says that we may expect from His Almighty power all things necessary for body and soul. Dear people, our God is an almighty Father. This means that nothing is impossible for Him. When He gives you what you need, He is willing to give you what you need because He is a gracious Father and He can give you what you need because He is an almighty Father. As such, He can give you all things that are necessary. All things, mind you, all things that are necessary. Not necessarily all the things you would want and you would wish to have, but all things necessary for the body and the soul. <clears throat> then there are, and I've spoken about that briefly last week as well, but there are those so-called unanswered prayers in your life. Prayers in which you have pleaded with God to give you this or to give you that, but He has not granted your request. Was this because He was not gracious enough? No. Was this because He could not give you what you asked of Him? No. Again. But because according to His wisdom, it was not necessary for you to have it. Sometimes, as Almighty Father, He will keep back things from you, though you have prayed for them, because those things would not be necessary for you or would even be harmful for your spiritual life. He is an Almighty Father, Almighty to give you 
what you need for body and for soul. And then I do not need to list the things that you need for body and soul. You know them well. Your Father, He knows all things. And you may ask for all the things you need in the name of Jesus Christ, His beloved Son. And you may be assured also that He will give more readily than any father on this earth all the blessings for your soul and for your body. And again we see what we learned at the very beginning that what you've heard about the Father can be learned of the Son and can be seen that He, the Son, communicates with the Father about those very promises that we lay before the Father in heaven. In the Father, we see the Son. In the Son, we see the Father. And the Holy Spirit portrays it for us in a beautiful way. What a blessing it is if we know ourselves to be children of the Father in heaven and we can pray, Abba, in heaven, so that we can also sing as we will do. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Amen. <clears throat> Let us close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, all the promises are in him, yea and amen. And we may trust that the promises that you have given to us will be fulfilled in due time, in your time, and that to the glory of your name, grant, O Heavenly Father, that we may experience that great familiarity, but at the same time, we may exercise great respect, for you are a Father in heaven. We thank you that you have revealed yourself in such a manner in your holy word. And we thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ, that you have answered Philip in such a manner that if you've seen him, that is, if you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. Heavenly Father, we adore you. We worship you. And we do pray that you would bless us also in our prayer life so that we may draw near to your throne of grace and need not worry that we will perish, but that we may say to you, Abba, Amen. <clears throat>